thank you. I didn't hear any of what was said, so... Uh, <laughs> hello. I'm relieved. I was afraid that there would be nobody here, because I know you had Alan Sugar yesterday, which I'm sure was compelling. Um, that was sarcasm. Um, so uh, this is what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to talk... I am relieved there's so many of you here. No, thank you. Um, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes, and then questions. We already had a fairly robust kind of question session upstairs. Uh, I, I won't um, assume that you want to know lots about me, but I, I, there are some things I want to say uh, that will include telling stories about me. Um, and they are, this is, this is the, three, uh, like, the three or four things I want to get across, which are things that I tell people, clients of mine, I'm a psychologist, organizational psychologist, um, who are disproportionately powerful, things that I want them to bear in mind at all times. And so I'm going to sell maybe three or four of these, and then we'll throw open for questions. And somebody, you, shall tap me on the shoulder when it is halfway, when it's half an hour gone. And then you can spit away with your questions. Um, and so three things, or four maybe, if we have time, that I tell disproportionately powerful people to be aware of um, in the form of stories. So when I was... I grew up in Stockport, which is up north, for those of you who have never been up there. Um, and when I was seven, six or seven years old, I knew, I knew exactly who I was. I knew that I was, um, I knew I was the smart kid who was reading Asimov. And I knew I was the hungry kid who really liked Greg's. I knew those two things about me. I knew I loved food and I knew I loved books. And uh, my mother quite literally fed both of those addictions, allowing me to read as many books as I could consume and not quite as much food as I ever wanted. And the interesting thing was, it, it, that all changed when I went to secondary school. 11 years old, I went to secondary school and all of a sudden I knew I was not the person I thought I was. I went to secondary school and I knew that I wasn't the super smart kid who had a hankering for steak slices. I knew I was something else. It was kind of, it started on my first day of school when I went to assembly and, um, and I was walking past some older students, uh, sixth formers, and the, the, one of the teachers. And, and one of the students grabbed me by the, the arm and he said, uh, so you're going to play rugby? And I'd never played rugby. I did not do things that involved sweating when I was young. So I did books and pie. And, um, and I said, uh, uh, no. And I remember the teacher looking at him and him looking at the teacher and the teacher saying, if he's not going to play rugby, what use is he? I was like, wow. But I'm, I was reading Asimov. It was really fascinating. It was crystallized because I went to, um, you know, not long after that, I'm in my English class and we're given a book to read. And I, I'm given this book, and I read the title, and I open it up, I start to read, and I was reading, reading. And we were told, put your books away, we've got a few weeks to read this, and then we're going to write a report, whatever else. And so I'm reading this book, and I've got it on my lap, as I'm supposed to be being educated on different things. The book was for later. And I've got it on my lap, and I continue to read through class. The bell goes, we go to the next class. It's on my lap in maths or geography or whatever it was, and I'm reading. And, and so it goes on until the end of the day when I head to the bus, I get on the bus and I'm still reading. And I get home and I'm sitting on the, the, the landing steps inside my house and I'm still reading. And then I finally finish and I look up and it's dark and I've missed dinner. So I know that this was a truly compelling book for me. And the thing about this book was it, I felt like it was talking about me. I'd read this book and it was the most important thing I'd done in a long while. And so I'm waiting because uh, my mom used to get up before we left to go to school, and she used to come back after we were supposed to be in bed. And so I've just read this book, and so I know I have to wait to talk to her. Uh, and my mother carried this huge set of keys with her wherever she went, and you could hear them jangling down the street as she came to the door. And so before she even got to the door, before she even managed to open the door, I am standing in front of the door with this book in front of me in an accusationary fashion. And um, as she walks in, and I can see her shoulders slump, because she's exhausted, and she knows that, you know, I have always liked a bit of drama, and she knows I'm up to something, and here I am, stood in front of her, with, accusing her with this book, 
and I said, Mum, am I a monster? And the book I'd been reading all day was The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And it was the first time I read a book that had the perfect combination of all the things that I experienced. I knew I wasn't a hunchback. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't delusional. But The Hunchback of Notre Dame, if you read it, it's a book that has uh, uh, this, it's not a protagonist actually, but it has, has the, the hunchback as a character who is both mocked and derided, feared, and also dense and emotionally illiterate as well as intellectually stunted. And, and I read this book and I was like, this mirrors exactly how people treat me when I walk out my door. I, I, when I leave my house, I am not the boy who reads asthma. I'm not the smart kid. When I leave my house, the three main reactions that I have to this day are, are that people come up to me or people walk by me and they will gasp and scream. I've, I've been in... Uh, an office where I'm a, a, a business where I'm a board member. It's a very large professional services company. And I had walked down the corridor and somebody screamed when I walked towards them. I was wearing a suit. Right? I wasn't just naked or something. They just, so that happens and it's been happening my entire life. The other thing that happens is people laugh a lot, mock and point. Um, to the point where I, I did a film a few years ago where they put body cameras on me and I walked down Market Street in Manchester, again, up north. And, um, and it filmed what people did. And what people do, I had them on my back and on my front, what people do is as I walk by them, three, four steps they go, and then they'll turn and they'll grab whoever they're with and be like, hmm, and nowadays it's, they'll take pictures and stuff. So the laughing, the kind of fear, and then the other thing that happens most of the time, especially if I'm not wearing a suit, is that people will come up to me and they will speak to me very slowly as if I am fresh off the boat and perhaps not that clever. So I read this book and I'm like, this is me. This, is, this must be what people see. So, so my first piece of advice for disproportionately powerful people such as yourselves is that every time you interact with somebody, you inform them something about themselves. For any old-fashioned type history of psychology people in here, which will be nobody. 1902, there's a guy called Cooley who came up with something called the looking glass self, the theory called the looking glass self, the idea that our identity is not just made up of stuff that fulminates and, and kind of uh, emerges over time, but our identity is actually made up of reflections of how the people around us see us. We reflect back what we see of other people in our faces. And so everywhere I went, I, this monster was reflected back. It was a really strange experience. I mean, the good news of that is that, that it doesn't have to be that way. We can, we can be disciplined and vigilant about how we interact with people. We can make sure that we don't reflect that back. And I'm very fortunate that that's happened to me too. Um, when I, you know, I, it got to a stage where I couldn't be in public, where I couldn't be in crowds. I still don't really do crowds unless I have to. Um, in order to avoid having to constantly deflect and almost cognitively manage these reflections of me as something I don't think I am. You know, I'm a fat old man, uh, but I'm geeky and smart. I'm not a monster, and I'm no more danger to you in your wallet than, well, I'm less danger than most of you guys because I'm a little less agile. So it really frustrates so when I was younger, age 17, uh, I was, when I was supposed to be going out and stuff, and I don't do it, the only time I'd go out is to go to the library. Manchester has this amazing central library. It's even more amazing now, actually. It's been refurbished. And the only time I would leave to go out into the crowds was on Saturday. I would leave to go out and, uh, and to go to central library, pick up six books, seven books, and I would also swing by because there's like three Greggs on Market Street alone. So I would walk down, after going to the library, the only way I could tolerate the world around me was by having the books under my arm, and I'd been to Greg's, and I would have steak slices like this in my fingers. And I would just eat them as I'm walking down the street and kind of looking over the heads as much as possible of the people who are staring back and telling me I'm a monster. And then all of a sudden I'm doing that, and one day a man steps up in front of me, and the problem is that when people do purposefully try and interact with me, generally they say very stupid things. I know it's people trying to strike up a conversation, but I'm not very charitable about it nowadays. 
And so they step up and they say uh, things like, God, you're tall, as if it's a revelation to me. Or they say, um, uh, you know, people say things like, how big are your feet? And think about that for a second. I mean, when did it become appropriate to ask strangers about the size of their body parts? It's such a weird thing. But it happens every day. Happened on the train today, on the way here. Lovely lady, meant nothing by it. How big your feet? Weird to me. Um, so anyway, this man steps up, and I'm expecting that kind of nonsense. And instead, he looks at me, and there's no derision, there's no mockery, there's no fear, which is a start. And he looks at me, and he says, um, well, he doesn't say, do you want to play basketball? Because had he said that, I would have said, I've got six books here that I've never read. And, uh, well, three remaining steak slices here. I have no need for your sport. Uh, he didn't even say you should play basketball, which I'm insulted by on a daily basis. People still tell me that. And I don't understand why they think I look like I still do any activity. But they say you should play basketball. And we should always avoid that. Another one of those disproportionately powerful people things. We should always avoid saying things that we think people should do. Because really what we're telling people is this is what you're good for. And even when we think that's a compliment, it's almost never a compliment. Instead, he said, you would be great at basketball. And I, I quite literally looked around myself. And I was like, this, this, this might be the first time outside of my house anyone's ever said I could be great at something. And I remember saying, go on. Tell me more. And I literally didn't know anything about basketball, just like now, practically. There's nobody who even cares about it in this country, really. So it wasn't that I was drawn to the, the amazingness of it all. I had no concept of what it was. I knew it probably involved a basket and a ball, but that was about it. He said, yeah, you'd be great at basketball. And I was like, there it is again. So I got involved in basketball. And that shows you. I mean, just as we have the power to make people feel like monsters, especially the more disproportionately powerful we are, that impact is greater. We have the power to make people feel like they can be something a bit special, and that's what he did for me. That's a man, to this day, I don't know his name. I don't know who he is. I never met him again. He gave me the name of somebody to contact, to play basketball, and that's what started me off. And I have no idea who he was. But I do know that he's the man who I met, and when I looked in the mirror of his face, possibly for the first time I saw my potential. And that's pretty cool. It's something that powerful people have the power to do, especially if strangers can do it like that. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, there's no real amazing segue, because normally I can talk for like four hours, as you probably gathered, right? So there's no amazing segue to this. But I just want to let you know that one of the things that powerful people do really poorly is that, that well, Small people have terrible spatial awareness, is what I'm trying to say. Small people, you, you are very bad with your space. On a daily basis, I walk down the street, and if I do not take great care, you walk into me all the time. And I think you have terrible spatial awareness because you're tiny, for the most part, and so anytime you actually physically hit somebody or bump into somebody, your interaction goes something like, toodle doodle doo bump, oh, sorry about that, and then you move on. And so you get into this idea that your interactions with other people are inconsequential. The damage you do to people is inconsequential if you're thoughtless or careless. And so you can be thoughtless and careless all the time. Again, today, in the offices of this organization, when not screaming at me, I'm in the corridor, which is busy, with people doing that kind of West Wing-like conversation where they're chatting as they walk. And I find myself all the time having to pin myself against the wall so that people don't walk into me. The reason I mention this is because big people have great spatial awareness. We may not be very coordinated, and I am less coordinated as years go by, but we always know who's around us. Because small people, you're constantly getting into our blind spots. There's rarely a day goes by where I'm not standing somewhere, especially in bars and things like that, where somebody will just stand like right here where I can't see them. The reason I'm pointing this out to you is because people who are bigger, we are disproportionately powerful by 
definition. And we can't afford to have poor spatial awareness. We can't afford to, to walk around the world without vigilance. I say this because most of you are small and most of you will become something great, I hope. And if you fall into the trap of thinking as you get great, your interactions with other people are inconsequential. Terrible stuff happens. And, not, and even, not, not even when you mean it to. I remember Christmas. I don't know what it was. I want to say 1998 or something like that. I went, to, I, went to my first, I went to my first gay club. My sister brought me along and told me I had to behave myself and be nice to, nice to the gays. It's ironic. Um, and uh, I was down there, and the Jackson 5 came on. You've no idea who they are. But anyway, um, and so I start dancing, and I'm, I'm prolific, as you can imagine, as a dancer all over the place. And suddenly, I turn around, and there's this guy, and his nose is just like, like I've destroyed it. It's just, ah. And I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, this is unbelievable. This happened only because I decided that my fun was really important. Because I knew, I knew, I may have been a little drunk, but I knew that I can't afford to not be vigilant for even a second, because terrible stuff happens. And I was like, there it is, that's the exact example. So that's why now, it's not just why, but part of the reason why now, if I'm in a bar and there's music going on, I'm a, ta I'm a, a lean against the wall shimmy, I am not a dancing in the middle, because if I am, there is carnage with bodies flying left and right. <laughs> Disproportionately powerful people, we have to be more vigilant of the space and the people around us, otherwise we do accidental damage, even when we don't mean to. People, um, people often embrace the kind of privileges of their power without embracing the vigilance and responsibility that comes with it. And I always think that's worth a, worth a mention, especially here, I suppose. Uh, how are we for time? Yeah, we're good, <coughs> about half an hour. Oh, sweet. All right. Um, all right, I've got one more story, but I can wait to the end. Maybe I'll tell it in the bar. Um, so this is your time. Um, let's see how controversial it gets, how quickly. Uh, I am, my sister always tells me that I'm a polarizing character. People either love me or hate me. And I always remind my sister that I'm six foot ten and... 24 stone, and I don't care either way. So <laughs> let's see what you've got to say. Maybe I'll start off with a quick question. Please, go. Um, so, you know, it's really interesting. You were saying how um, it was never kind of growing up. You were never going to be a basketball player. That was never on the radar in particular. And I believe you only started playing age 17. Mm -hmm. Do you think that society is too quick to tell young people these days that they're past their sell-by date, they can't go on, go on and do something? I think... Society is too quick to decide which kind of people should do certain things. We're very good at telling people if you haven't taken this subject and this subject. I mean, I had a conversation today with the organization I'm working with, and we are, we're trying to radically rehaul graduate recruitment. And I had a full-on proper argument with somebody, a senior partner, who couldn't believe that we were going to look outside of the, um, what's it called, the group of elite universities, I don't know why I've forgotten the name of them now, Russell, Russell Group. He was, he was incredulous. You're going to look outside the Russell Group? So I'm not sure that we'd, we'd, we do it too late. I just think we constantly imagine that we know that a certain type of person has a certain type of use, and if you don't fit that mold, you don't. And it's not just demographics that we would measure, like race and sexuality and gender. It's things like if you're an introvert as a man, you're far less likely to succeed in, in professional services or banking or things like that. Even within jobs that you wouldn't necessarily equate uh, a kind of extrovert personality as important, you often find in the pure sciences, you're less likely to be published, you're less likely to have your published work be recognized and peer reviewed in a way that, that really allows it to flourish. And it seems to me that we, we, we really narrow the potential for, for brilliance by doing that. It's a question over on that side of the back, yeah. Um, when you started to play basketball, when did you know that it was your burning passion, not just uh, your hobby that you did in your spare time? Uh, it was never my passion. It was never my passion. Um, no, that's not fair. I mean, it was my passion initially, but not for the reasons that, that you might think. So. 
<clears throat> after 40, I, I went to my first basketball session in my rugby kit, because it was what, what we had for school, and plimsolls, which again, none of you are old enough to know what they are, but maybe. Um, and I went in there and I was surrounded by people, and it was that thing again where these people, I walked in the door of this community gym, and everything stopped, just one basketball, bounce, bounce, bounce. And they're all staring at me, and this is the point with my experience of the world where people usually come with pitchforks and torches, and, and, but it wasn't that. They suddenly start running towards me and grabbing my arms, and like, he's on our team. And I looked in the faces of these strangers, and, I, and all I could see was the same thing I saw on that. I didn't know what basketball was still at that point. Again, it was confirmed. There's a basket and there's a ball. But I didn't know anything about the game. But on the faces of these people, they looked at me like, this guy could be special. And I, I ran with that. 45 minutes I was in that session. It was the most exercise, quite literally, I'd ever done. And at the end of that session, we're undoing our shoes. And we're talking. And they start talking about this thing, the NBA. I said, what's that? He said, it's where the best players in the world play. And so my brain did that amazing kind of teenage extrapolation, right? So if this is basketball at its lowest level and this is this good in terms of how it felt, then playing at the highest levels must feel amazing, right? If these people make me feel like I'm special, then the people I'm surrounded by playing elite sports will make me feel like I'm a superstar, right? Sound logic, terrible, terrible you know, flaws. Um, but that's, so 45 minutes in, I asked him, what does NBA stand for? And he said, National Basketball Association. I said, yeah, that's where I'm going to play. And there are three people around me, Chris, Jamie, and the guy called Pluto, who is a Cypriot. I said, yeah, that's where I'm going to play. And they looked at me and they were like, sounds good. <laughs> 45 minutes, decision made. Who was the greatest player you ever played against? Greatest player? I mean, I played against Jordan, who is... I don't remember really. I mean, this is the thing about Jordan, about him. There's a mystique around him. So my first ever game was against the Chicago Bulls and I walked on, I was starting. I walked onto the, uh, the court. I know I must have shaken hands or slapped five with all five of them and he must have been one of the five I slapped five with. And I don't remember any of that. I remember that my team lost by 30 and I led my team with 12 points. And I remember sitting on the bus be like, yes. We, and it was like, we lost by 30, so I had to look around to make sure people didn't see me. But I was like, I, I led the team in scoring. He was amazing. Uh, I, I've seen video of me playing against him, but he's not my position. So I, I just want to be clear, I've never had to guard him. That would be a terrible thing. OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, would you mind waiting for the microphone when it comes around? But uh, yeah, gentlemen here at the front. Just for the recording. And then one at the very back. Sure, so let me lead with, I'm a former Penn State player, and we both wore number 13, so oh, gotcha. there's a bit of a connection there. Um, so talking about books, 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 you went over to play in the States at university and then subsequently in the NBA. The culture isn't necessarily one of books, books, books all the time. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how did that work for you and what was it like for you going into that experience? Uh, I was very strict about um <clears throat> about my experience. So I wanted, I, early days of computers, I, there was a computer in my high school. I went to high school in America for one year to Toledo, Ohio. Uh, it's not the most exotic place, but they were, they, were, they were stalwarts. They really helped me on my way. And in my school, there was this computer where you could look up schools by basic criteria. I mean, no, nothing so complicated as a Boolean search or anything, but it, by criteria. And so I put in you know, psychology programs, great psychology programs, and basketball. And I ended up with a, a couple of different schools. One of them was Wake Forest. Uh, they didn't want me even remotely. One of them was Northwestern, a school who I summarily, whose ass I summarily kissed, kicked for the next four years of my college experience. They didn't want me. And, uh, and then there was Vanderbilt University, which is where I ended up going first. Uh, I, I picked schools that paired great psychology, because I was never a basketball player. I'm, I, I tell you this as, as a fact, just in case you ever have a friend who's ever going to meet me. I'm insulted when people say, you're the basketball player. 
It's insulting. I'm not exactly sure how many years of graduate school I have to do. Maybe I need another PhD, I don't know what it is. But at some stage, I need people to recognize that since the age of seven, I was the smart fat kid who liked books. And now I'm the old smart fat man who likes books. The basketball was just a... You know what the basketball was? The basketball, I wanted... Uh, I wanted everyone who'd ever made fun of me in England. I'd wanted them all, if asked the question, who's the very best British basketball player ever, I would wanted them all to have to say me, despite how much that might be painful for them. And that's what it was that drove me. I ended up leaving Vanderbilt because my coach said I was terrible. And um, I had a choice of believing a coach who had just come from North Carolina, um, or believing me and my conviction. I believed me and went to Penn State. And it was, Penn State was the right choice because I got m far more recruited the second time round. Um, I even remember going somewhere with a very famous coach and I walked into the gym and then this recording started playing. I thought I was in the wrong, you know, at too early or something, but they sent me to the gym at this time. I walk in and suddenly this recording starts and it's a basketball game going on, but they've inserted my name into it. There's 10 seconds left in the game. John M. H. has got the ball in the corner. He's double teamed. He's dribbled through the double team. He's got it. He shoots. He's, it goes in and the crowd goes crazy. And the, this is the whole gym is, it's amazing. And I remember hearing this and thinking how amazing it was and then turning around and saying, all of this is a lie. All of this. And I left. I left the gym before anybody even showed up. I left, uh, went back to the hotel, rearranged my flight, and I went back to my, my family's home, the family who put me up in Toledo. Um, and then I went uh, to Penn State and I walked into the gym and, and you know the old rec hall is this tiny, I mean it's not tiny on a, British scale probably, I don't know, 8,000, 9,000 people maybe it holds, but on a basketball, big time basketball scale, it's quite small. And I sat in there and on these bench seats and I looked down on the floor and it's one of those rare places where regular people are allowed to play on the floor. And, and so there's this bunch of old, what I then thought were old teachers playing basketball, their bodies betraying them with every step. Uh, and I watched it with some contempt. And then the coach finally comes in and he sits down next to me and he says, I'm not going to promise you anything, but if you work hard, we think you can be quite good. And I remember looking at it and thinking, this, this is the truth. And he, Bruce Parker was my coach at the time and he was as interested in me having, being an academic All-American as he was in me being an outstanding basketball player. That was an overly long answer. Sorry, go. Thank you. I was going to ask, do you think that your sense of identity has been shaped by negative influences or in spite of them, and do you think it makes a difference? Sorry, one more time. <laughs> do you think your sense of self has been shaped by negative influences or in spite of them, and do you think it makes a difference? No. No. Uh, I, sorry, that's a terrible answer. So, has my sense of identity been shaped by negative instances? Almost certainly. Yes, without a doubt. Um, it's one of those things, it's so unfortunate. We live in a world where people somehow still believe that negative experiences make stronger men. Um, and I don't think it does. It makes men who are crispy on the outside but incredibly fragile on the inside. And uh, I think it's a shame. I'm lucky that I've had enough good experiences that have offset that, enough good reflections. I had a mother who was just so awesome. That, that she offset a lot of the damage that would, might otherwise have been done. But I know many of the things that I'm insecure about, I mean, I, I, are a function of, of the way people see me. Um, I know the flush that I get when I read something and it says John Amici, basketball player. I know the anger I feel in that moment is a function of, of me trying desperately to stop people seeing me as a monster. Um, but being able to intellectualize it and kind of examine it doesn't necessarily mean the problem goes away. Um, but, you know, I'm in a good place with it. I think I'm, I'm pretty pleased with, with how I turned out, warts and all. Question at the back. Um, I'm 
probably going to ask a question you've been asked many times before, but I was just wondering um, what your experience was of being a gay man in the NBA and also what made you finally come out? Um, I mean, being gay in the NBA is not in itself unusual. Um, I don't think that's really controversial to suggest. Um, being in the closet has a way of crystallizing other parts in your life. I, 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 I've often said that what I did was put my, my personal life in a box and tucked it under my dorm room bed uh, and it did not leave that space. But that really focuses your mind on other stuff. So all, all of a sudden, getting up at five o'clock to do an extra workout, um, uh, heading, to the, heading to early classes and taking a heavy class load, coming back in the summer, all of this is just an easy kind of functional, this is what I do to make up for all the space take, that I no longer have to use for this. I don't think it's healthy, but it, it certainly crystallized the mind. And I, there are plenty of people in professional sports for whom that is exactly their experience. In terms of why I came out, um, I didn't, I mean, I was out to, uh, in the same way most gay people are out, which is you're out to people who you care about, or at least remotely know you, and not to random strangers on the internet. Um, I can tell you it's quite, It's quite intimidating, in a sense, to be out to every random strangers on the internet because it's just it, you just you rarely disclose stuff about yourself to people you just do not care about or might actively not want to talk to. So it's a weird thing. But I was, you know, my family, friends, all of that stuff out. Um, I didn't come up publicly till 2007, and that's because I retired in 2005. And I, sorry, but I thought screw America and the craziness there. It was the height of the ev evangelical purge. <coughs> well, I suppose now it's heading towards it again. But uh, it, it was a time that was very difficult, I, I felt. And I was like, I'm just going to come home. I live in Manchester. It's the gayest city in the world, right? So I, I did anyway at the time. I was like, I'm just going to come home, have a life, be a fat psychologist in Manchester. And so that's what I did. And I, I came home and I went to, I've never been really a big Pride fan, but I went to Manchester Pride. And I stood in the grounds of Manchester Cathedral. I don't know why, somehow I felt it was ironic, but anyway. So I was standing in the, the grounds of Manchester Cathedral to watch. And um, Ian McKellen is the uh, Grand Marshal. And he comes by. But before he comes by, I look around me and I'm like, I'm suddenly joined by this kid, maybe 13, maybe, maybe 14. And he's kind of hiding within the tombstones and just watching. And Ian McKellen comes by, and he's on a pink Cadillac, of course, with the tightest pair of jeans you can imagine. And even then, he was not a young man, even at that stage. Um, and he's waving to everybody in that way that actors really can, where they can wave at people, and it's like, I'm, lo I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you, even though random stranger. And he waves in the general direction of the cathedral. And I see this kid. I see him shine. I thought it was amazing. Uh, I'm not very metaphysical with these things, but the kid shone. He stood up, he waved back, then suddenly got really self-conscious and then left. And I watched this, and I'm not trying to suggest that I'm like Ian McKellen, I, I know I'm not, right? Um, but uh, maybe I serve a slightly different demographic than him. Maybe I can offer a different kind of role model than him, I thought. And so that's when I decided to, to come up publicly, because I thought, if I could do that for one kid, that would be pretty cool. How did you deal with comments, though, from people like Tim Hardaway, who were saying that they wouldn't have you playing on their team? Well, there's two sides to this. One is that only an idiot would imagine they're not already around gay people of some description. Um, so it seemed really odd that he would say it within sports. I mean, he played. He's already played with gay people, which is just ridiculous. But I, I don't mind. I was, we were saying earlier, I had a rather forthright conversation about religion, which I tend to have um, earlier. I don't mind if people are explicit about their views. I just, what I don't like is when people obfuscate. If you, if you don't like gay people and you want to use, I mean, on a daily basis, somebody on the internet will call me a faggot. I have no issue with that. On a weekly basis, somebody will call me a nigger. I have no problem with that. I mean, I will rebut it, and I will try and make you feel as tiny as possible. 
and expose your words to the universe so people know it's still going on. But I have no problem with the explicit. What I hate is the people who use euphemisms and then get offended when they get called out for using the euphemisms. I have no, I have no issue with the language. If, you, if that's how you feel, if you, if you, I mean, because you, you are declaring you're a moron by doing it. If that's who you are, be that. You know, join the toothless hordes of people who think like you. No problem. What I don't like is the people who say stuff, but use language that is more sophisticated so as to avoid triggering, you know, the automatic sanction of their hate. And then when challenged on it, say, what do you mean? All I said was, you must like a lot of watermelons. All I said was something, something about monkeys. I'm not being racist. You're being the PC police. Those are the people I hate. The other ones I just feel sorry for. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm from the university basketball team. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a big fan of Bologna, where you actually played. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you, um, um, you have made some unusual decision as an athlete, as a professional player. You turned down at some point a millionaire contract from the Lakers if that was correct what, information. Uh, some 15, 17 million contract from LA when you were playing in Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I guess, after retirement or soon after you decide to come back and play for England at the Commonwealth Games. Uh, these are just weird decision for a professional player, so especially the first one. Uh, what, what drove it? I mean, how does that relate with your way of the, conceiving of basketball? The second one first, the, the Commonwealth Games was not my choice. I, I was semi-blackmailed into playing for the Commonwealth Games team. Because uh, I'd retired, I went into full-on pie mode. I mean, I was, I was done. I, I, I have not touched a basketball apart from one charity game in probably four years. Um, I mean, you quite literally, unless it's a charity thing and a lot of money's being raised, you would have to pay me a huge amount of money to ever touch one again. Um, so, but I was told that if we won a medal, then we get funding for the Olympics. So I had no choice. I had to haul my carcass up and down a court um, at, at a much impaired rate, I would point out, in order for us to get a medal, which we did, and get, a team, get the initial funding for an Olympic team. That was the point. The Lakers contract, uh, the, I really wanted to play for the Lakers. It was everything I wanted. I knew that if I went to the Lakers, I would win five championships at least, as it happens in the period of the contract they won five championships. I knew that would happen, because they were that good. Um, I knew that I would not even have to contribute in order for them to do that. I could just sit on the bench, work really hard in practice, and Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant would make it happen. Robert Ory, a number of other guys. The problem was, that year I had 17 offers for contracts. The Lakers wasn't even the highest one. Um, the year before, I, I went to Chicago and Denver and New York and all these other places and I, in person, begged general managers for meetings and then begged general managers in those meetings to give me a shot. Minimum contract, 10 day, whatever, give me a shot. Not one of them would give me a shot. The only person who gave me a shot was, was uh, Dr. J. Have you heard of Dr. J? Well, you've heard of Dr. J. So there's two people. He's very famous. Before there was Jordan, there was Dr. J. And he was, the, um, he was one of the, the office staff of the Orlando Magic and told the general manager to, to talk to me. And the general manager talked to Doc Rivers and Doc Rivers said, I'll give you a shot. And so I went from having no opportunity to play to having an opportunity to play to being a really good player in the NBA with the Orlando Magic. And the next year, the Orlando Magic reminded me that I, they'd give me a chance when nobody else had. And I talk a lot, all the time, about being a person of principle. And the problem with that is that normally we're tested in the most mundane of ways, right? We're tested when there's one bottle of milk less and you see an old woman who looks clearly in need of the calcium. And so you give her the bottle first. We're tested when there's a car park space close to the shop and you give it to the, 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 the family that's got a pram in the back and whatever else. And then we feel really good about ourselves. Aren't I a person of principle? And the, and the problem was, I, it just so happens that my first real test was somebody came to me and offered me everything I'd ever wanted. And um, 
and then somebody else reminded me that they'd give me a shot. And it, do not mistake this for loyalty. There is no loyalty in sports. Sorry, people. It doesn't exist. It's manufactured to help at contract time. It doesn't exist. It was just that I returned the favor. I returned the favor. You can't be a part-time man of principle, right? Can't be principled when it's milk and car park spaces and that not principled when it's everything you've ever wanted. The huge advantage is that nowadays I'm a psychologist. I work with some reasonably high profile people in big organizations and I, all the time I get asked, can I trust you with this? Can we trust you with this information? You know, give me your word. How much is your word worth? And there are very few people in this world who can actually put a figure on it. And I can. You mentioned earlier that you only came out publicly as gay in 2007 mm -hmm. after you'd finished being a professional basketball player. How much do you think attitudes have changed since then? And if you were a professional player now, would you feel comfortable coming out? There are loads of, there are loads of athletes who are out amongst their team. I was out amongst my team with Orlando. Um, we, we had a conversation. I, I got on, we we travelled in amazing planes, right? So each team has their own plane. And I was on the plane one day. I was studying for my doctorate. Um, and so I had a little table to myself and my laptop, which is about that thick. Um, and I'm, I'm typing away. And suddenly I noticed that the entire of the, the, the team is all around another table. That happens from time to time when there are really, we have really surprisingly cool discussions on there. Big discussion about systemic racism one time. Big discussion about democratic policy versus really interesting. What, not what you'd expect. So I didn't think of any of it. And then all of a sudden I'm looking and I realize that it's one of those ones where you know it's about you. When people are like huddled and every once in a while they're going. And then back to the group. And so that happens. I'm just, I'm ignoring it and typing away. And then one of the players, a guy called Monty Williams, uh, he was the coach of the Pelicans, I think, last year. He came up and I'm typing away and he looks at me and he kind of just leans against the chair and says, so Meech. Um, you don't talk much about women. And I remember looking at him, and, and then there's an entire group of people who are all huddled around and pretending that they're not looking, but all looking. Uh, and and I, I said to him, indeed. And he looked at me and said, uh, cool, cool, good talk, and then walked away. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. So th there are plenty of people, there are plenty of people out in that same way amongst their teams. And the, and even amongst some parts of their teams and not others. Um, they're just not out to the universe, um, which I don't think is a, a huge deal. But has it changed dramatically? No, no, no. You know, there's nothing about the IOC or FIFA or FIBA or any of these major organizations that <coughs> imbues you with a sense of their ethics and progressive nature. They are what they've always been obfuscating little evil empires. That might be overstating it slightly. Um, you spoke a lot about this perception of you that you have sometimes of people perceiving you as a monster rather than perhaps human being. I was wondering whether this has ever played into your advantage perhaps during your playing days when it was kind of an advantage to be perceived as a monster. I was just wondering whether that had ever been good for you. It's interesting, I've never been asked that. I don't think so. I mean, the truth is that, that, that if you start to dig slightly deeper into, into how people feel about race and how people would... I am not much of a monster because I'm way too light-skinned, for example, to be the proper type. If I was purple, if I was like proper dark, then I imagine my impact on the world would be just awesome. I mean, people already cross the street. I, I can travel on the seven o'clock train from Manchester to London with nobody sitting at my four top table with me. The place can be crowded and people can be standing in the vestibules, but no one will sit with me. I can only imagine that I could clear a carriage if I was a bit darker, maybe a bit more cut. Um, but you, ha you have to imagine, in the NBA, people, they, they, they don't have those same impressions. Plus, the whole reason that I have facial hair at all is because my teammates in college told me that my voice was never going to do. 
my accent and the fact that I use words with more than one syllable will never do in sports. And so the only way I'm going to have any credibility, and this is what they said, a guy called Elton, one of my teammates, the only way you're going to have any credibility in this game is if you grow a goatee. So I grew a goatee. So, no, they didn't find me that intimidating. Weird, but not intimidating. Um, can I ask why psychology? Um, can I answer that question last? Yeah. I'll, I'll tell the story. Mine's actually just not a question. Um, I grew up gay and Mormon in Salt Lake City, Utah, watching you play. Uh huh. And I was the kid who shone when you came out. So thank you. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Hmm. I was not expecting that. Thank you. Um, so why psychology? Um, my mother was a GP in Cheadle. Um, that's up north. Um, and I used to go on visits with her. Um, and we would walk into these houses. She did a lot of work with um, palliative care. Um, St. Anne's and Christie's are both up there, who are, which are hospices. And so I would, work, I would see a lot of families where people weren't going to get better and she was just there to make things more comfortable and help people cope. And she would walk in and immediately be whisked upstairs to deal with whoever was sick. And I would sit down in living rooms with whoever was left. And sometimes it would be one person, a spouse or a partner. And sometimes it'd be you know, literally 20 people, an entire extended family sat there. And um, I could feel, even at, this was, I was like seven years old when this happened. 1977, seven years old when I first went out with her. And, and you could feel the pressure in the room. You could just feel it. I remember telling my mum, it's, it's like it's crushing my chest because the tension was that high. And I started to associate it with a noise because I would go into these rooms and any time the doctor visited, these families would always crack out their best china. And so everybody would be holding a saucer with a, with a cup. But because of the tension, and because of the fear and whatever else, all their hands would be shaking and there was this tinkling noise that was almost overwhelming in the room, especially when it was more than one or two people. And then they would hand me a cup with a little bit of tea in the bottom, and my hands would be shaking because I'm seven years old and somebody's just handed me bone china. So it's like... And then my mother would come downstairs and she did this thing always before she walked into a room. She did this thing where she would stand in the doorway and just look at the room. And it was like she was, she was grabbing people with her attention. She was letting them know in that couple of seconds that she stood there that they, I've been to something else before this, and I have something else to do after this, but the next three minutes, these are just you. And I thought this was remarkable, and it had an impact on people. You could see people shift. Then she would sit down, and they would hand her a cup, and her hand would be like a rock. The cup would be silent. And then the moment she was sat down and had taken her first slurp, people would just fire stuff at her. Dr. Machi, I can't cope. I don't know what to do. How do I manage this? And she would let them talk and let them talk. And then after a while, when, especially if it started to rise, she would just be like, no, 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 no. You can do this. And the doctor made you, you don't understand. I, I don't think I can. You can do this, she would say. And to kind of wipe away their words with her hands, which I thought was really interesting. She was like, no, 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 you can do this. Like parting their words. You're going to do this and this and this. And then I'm going to see you in a week. And then somebody would say, you're right, Dr. Machi, we can do this. I'll do this, this, and this, and I'll see you in a week. And I was like, this is amazing. What my mum is doing, she's doing something right now to these people. The cups were shaking, and now they're still. I couldn't breathe, and now we can. They had all these questions, and now they know exactly what to do. I was like, she's doing something. I knew it was something special. And then I, I was really, I was made it made clear how amazing it was because 1977, you're all too young to know, but it was when the original Star Wars came out, right? It was the best year of my life, pretty much. It was amazing. And I, I went to see Star Wars with my mum. My mum sat next to me and we shared a big box of popcorn. And there's a scene about 25 and a half minutes in to Star Wars, approximately where Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker are in the speeder, the droids are in the back, and they're heading into Mos Eisley. And uh, if you haven't seen this film, please don't wait for the new ones. 
This is going to be amazing. It's amazing. They're heading into Mos Eisley, and they get stopped by the stormtrooper. And the stormtroopers have some, a little bit of dialogue, and then essentially they say, are these, the droids you look, these are the droids we're looking for. And Obi-Wan Kenobi looks at them and goes, uh, these aren't the droids you're looking for. And I don't know, the first time I watched Star Wars, I don't know what happened for the next 10 minutes of Star Wars. Because I saw Obi-Wan Kenobi do this, and then, of course, the, star, the stormtroopers repeat back, yeah, these aren't the droids we're looking for. Obi-Wan Kenobi looks at them and says, uh, we can move along. And they say, move along, move along, blast off, save the universe. Right? We know how it ends. So I'm watch- this happens, and suddenly I- I'm not watching the film anymore because I'm just staring at my mother. Because I'm like, this is what she does. And so I think my mother detects that I'm watching, and I'm just kind of staring up at her. And she's reached over some more popcorn, and she looks at me, and all she does is go... And so from the age of seven, I was convinced that my mother was a Jedi. And, 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 and I thought this was amazing, because this, this involves stuff, right, now? Because if she's a Jedi, then I'm a Jedi. And, uh, but she hasn't talked to me about it, so this must mean, this must mean that uh, I'm not of age. I was like, I'm an enterprising kid. Instead of waiting for this, I'm going to go to the library, the source of all knowledge. There's a library next to my mom's surgery. I went to the library, I put my hands on the table, and I looked at the librarian, and I said, I need some books about becoming a Jedi. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she said, well, the Star Wars books, and I didn't even let her finish. I was like, you misunderstand me. <laughs> and I explained that my mother did this, and people did what she said, and the tension went down. And she said, that sounds like psychology, and those books were over there. So I start to walk towards the psychology books, and then I stop. I'm seven years old. And I turn back to her, and I say, you can call it what you like. And then I walk on, I pick up the psychology books, and that was when I knew I'd be a psychologist. Because it's as close as I can be to being a Jedi. <laughs> so there you go. Wow.